I think about the future, not only my lifetime, but far, far beyond. I want to know what's real, whether there's meaning and purpose other than what we make or make up for ourselves. Somehow I sense the future holds clues. Generally, when we think about the future, we think 20, 30 years. To speculate 1,000 years seems impossible. 150 years ago, the fastest communication was the Pony Express. Today, the World Wide Web pulsing at light speed is virtually instantaneous. Now, try to imagine a million years, a billion years, and even beyond. Into what? What's the far future of intelligence in the universe? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Freeman Dyson is one of the world's most innovative thinkers, physicist, philosopher, visionary. The far, far future is Dyson territory. We meet at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. I ask Freeman to categorize the far, far future. I make a distinction between sort of four uh, futures. The first, the, the future of the solar system, which is, say, 1,000 years, when humans will bring the solar system to life. And, and so we, we are more or less spread over the solar system. A million years it'll take roughly to spread over the galaxy. A billion years would be roughly how long it will take for life to spread over the universe. I mean, give or take a factor of 10. And, and, mm -hmm. and then the fourth f future is after that, after the, the <laughs> present universe has passed away, when the stars have faded, when things are getting colder and colder and less and less is happening, when essentially all that's left is a few black holes, a, a few lumps of iron, which used to be planets, and the remnants of stars, and perhaps some very dilute plasma, and that's it. And the question is, can life adapt to that kind of, of an environment? I think it could. The best way to look at this, I think, is through science fiction. And one of the best is The Black Cloud, which is a book of Fred Hoyle, who was a famous astronomer mm. and also a good writer of fiction. And The Black Cloud is a story about a form of life which is simply a, 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 a cloud of dust grains which floats around th through space. And the dust grains are in communication through electric and magnetic fields. So instead of nerves and muscles and brain, it just has uh, patterns of electric and magnetic fields. It's not dependent on liquid water for its functioning. So these dust grains could be uh, essentially at, at zero temperature. So as the temperature gets colder and colder, the cloud has to expand gradually and grow a little bit larger so that the, the fields become weaker, but they still could uh, perform <laughs> mental functions and c carry information and memory. So what would that mean for the temporal structure of a, of a thought? Thoughts would have to slow down as, as the temperature falls and as the, the cloud expands. Each thought would uh, probably be something like the time it takes for electromagnetic signals to travel from one side of the th cloud to the other. Yeah. So it might be seconds, it might be hours, it might be years. Yeah. Of course, the creature has infinite time, so <laughs> it doesn't mind being slow. <laughs> <laughs> from the point of view of the creature, I mean, a thousand years are, are just but as yesterday. And <laughs> that sounds the, almost biblical. It is biblical. <laughs> and, and the, <laughs> so the unit of time is set by the creature's own consciousness. Is it conceivable that it could go forever? It's conceivable. The question whether the universe expands exponentially, of course, is very important. If it is a linear expansion with the universe just continuing to expand as we observe it now, then life can, can in principle, continue forever. 
if the expansion is exponential, then we can't. Then that's bad news for life. To understand the far, far future, consider two categories. The first is measured in thousands, millions, and billions of years. And the question is, what will intelligence be or do? The second goes out multiple trillions of years after the stars burn out. And the question is, can intelligence survive? Freeman claims that if the universe expands linearly, then life could survive indefinitely. But if the rate of universal expansion is accelerating, then no, life cannot last forever. I should speak with a cosmologist. Lawrence Krauss is professor of physics and director of the Origins Initiative at Arizona State University. He loves speculating about the far, far future, but he does so with tough-minded realism Lawrence, is there a possible future for intelligence, especially in a universe that we now know is not only expanding, but under accelerating expansion? Well, if that acceleration continues, as I like to say, we live in the worst of all possible universes to live in for the future of life. So, so much for intelligent design. But, <laughs> but uh, you can show that in, among all, all universes that, that are continuing to expand forever, a universe which is accelerating, life will end in such a universe before it will end in any other universe. And that's even if you can avoid all of the tragedies that are going to befall this planet, for example. The, the sun is going to get brighter, and in two billion years, the Earth will then be in a zone where Venus is now, and the surface of the Earth will be about a thousand degrees. In five billion years, the sun will expand and eat up the Earth and lots of things, proton decay, all sorts of things are going to be false. But let's say we're smart enough to get around all that stuff. It turns out that there are fundamental constraints on life and therefore intelligence in, a, in the very long term. We do know, for example, that for a long time, life can exist as we know it with intelligence that's powered by solar power, which is what our plan is for at least, uh, oh, a trillion to 10 trillion years, because there will be stars more or less like our sun that will be around for that long. There'll be life and there, may, and there could be intelligence, but it won't be very happy, okay? Because, especially if it's intelligent, because if the universe is accelerating, then the rest of the universe is slowly disappearing before our very eyes. Distant stars are moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And if we wait long enough, Everything outside of our local cluster of galaxies will have disappeared. But you go far enough into the future, and you're, you wind up with nothing. That's you what You wind really up with, like. with, with a random photon every galaxy space oh, no, or but if you're willing, But if you're willing to be a science fiction aficionado or, 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 or very inventive physicist, you might say, what do you mean? Big deal. Your sense of time could change, right? So right now, you know, a few minutes may seem like a lot, but in such a universe, you could have a living system where if it had a thought every 10 trillion years, that would seem normal. We have a pace of life that's based on really the energy available to us now. You could imagine living conscious systems which have a very different pace and therefore can extend out at least a lot farther than you'd imagine otherwise. All modes right now seem like they will suggest that life will end. But, see, I don't want, I don't want people to get too depressed because the nice thing about life is also the following. It's a fluctuation. It violates, it sort of, it locally stores energy. In a universe that's getting more and more random, life likes to build up complexity. And so even if our life dies out, one could imagine at some time arbitrarily far in the future, a fluctuation occurs which, which allows intelligent life to exist again for a little while in a cosmic future, and then again and again. So you might have islands in time of intelligence. So even in a hopeless, pointless, miserable universe, there's something to look forward to. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. 
life cannot survive forever. Ultimately, all will be gone. So, Lauren says, the universe is hopeless, pointless, miserable. Based on what we know today, he is correct. But maybe it's too soon to know. Visionary Ray Kurzweil envisions a different kind of future. Looking through the lens of technology, he sees a picture that is stunning. Because when technology grows exponentially, everything we think we know changes dramatically. Ray, if we try to look out a million or hundreds of millions of years, what can we now think about differently than we did in the past? The important perspective to have is that the progression of this is exponential and not linear. So our, our whole species, is the technology-creating species, uh, evolved in only a few hundred thousand years. And then evolution, the, the cutting edge, focused on human technological creations. And that became its own evolutionary process. It started with steps that were tens of thousands of years, stone tools, fire. And if you look at today, we're actually doubling the power of information technology every year. And doubling every year is pretty fantastic because that means multiplying by a thousand in 10 years, a billion in 30 years. We carry in our pockets computers that are many thousands of times more powerful than the entire computation that all of MIT had when I, when I went here 40 years ago. And imagine multiplying it another billion fold while at the same time we shrink the size of these devices 100,000 in the next quarter century. For $1,000, you'll be able to have enough computation to simulate the entire human brain. That'll cost a dollar in 2030. It'll cost a penny in 2037. Go on to 2045. That's a date I've designated as the singularity. The non-biological intelligence that, that our civilization creates will be a billion times more capable than all of the biological intelligence. You got another 50 years, and it'll be trillions of trillions of times more powerful. So that's a really fantastic transformation. Think ahead a million years. I mean, it's hard to think ahead a hundred years if we're going to multiply the intelligence of our civilization, you know, trillions or even trillions of trillions fold within a century or so. Ultimately, one kilogram of, of matter could be something like 10 to the 50th uh, calculations per second, which is you know trillions of trillions of times more powerful than the human brain. Uh, that's the ultimate limit. We will get to those limits by, say, on the order of 100 years from now. And we will saturate the matter and energy that we care to devote to computation in our vicinity, say, on this planet, and even, say, some nearby celestial bodies. At that point, that really is a limit, and the only way to, to really expand is to expand out into the rest of the universe. Ray claims that non-biological intelligences will cause disruptions within decades. What then in a billion years? It's almost impossible to see beyond this short-term disruption, Ray says. So a billion years is inconceivable. But if Ray is right, so many questions scream out at me. What will it mean to be human? What are the ultimate limits of intelligence? Can radically new technologies alter the destiny of our universe? Exploring the far, far future demands that we look far out. Among real scientists, I do not know anyone more far out than Frank Tipler, a physicist at Tulane University. His far, far future is really wild. Frank, I guess I'm normal in that I would love to be immortal. You claim that there's a way we can be in some far future of the universe. Uh, are, you, are you kidding with me? 
I think not only is it possible, it's inevitable that every person who is living now and who has ever lived will be resurrected in the far future, never to die again, i.e. the claim made by all the traditional religions. All right, tell me how it works. Pure physics, Robert. What happens is over time, physics is going to require living things to move out and take control of the universe. One of the things they'll do is counsel the acceleration that the universe is now undergoing. When that happens, the universe will expand to a maximum size and then start to collapse in and on itself. Now as that occurs, life will be able to gain control of the entire universe and use the power of collapse. Energy will be released in the collapse to increase their power literally without limit as you're going into the final state of the universe, the final singularity. So what's happening is computer power is increasing without limit all over the universe as you're going into the final state. Now eventually the computers will become powerful enough that they can make a perfect emulation of the entire universe today and everyone who has ever lived will be recreated as a computer emulation. How do you communicate the, or transmit the consciousness that we have now, the first person experience? Maybe it'll look like me, it'll look like you, and maybe it will be, feel it, like you, it will act like you, it will think like you. Anybody yeah, interact? Of course it will be you. Things which are identical down to the quantum state and this will be so accurate a reproduction, it will be identical to the current you down to the quantum state. The quantum theory of identity says it will be you. And just as a secret, you, you really believe this? Of course I believe it. I believe in the laws of physics. The laws of physics insist this is true, therefore I believe it. I'm a physics fundamentalist. To me, this is ludicrous on multiple levels nature of consciousness, limits of physics, fallacies of extrapolation. So bizarre, it's not even wrong. However, I do like how Fearless Frank tests ultimate boundaries as he pushes serious science to absurdity. I should hear from those who believe in God to theists, the future is core. But how do theists integrate what theology promises with what cosmology predicts? I ask Robin Collins, a Christian philosopher trained in physics. Robin, there is a virtual certainty that the universe will gradually expand into effectively nothingness. What is a theist do with that reality? Well, there's a couple of sort of answers a theist can do with that. One, they can just say the purpose of the universe was simply as a place for conscious beings like human beings to exist and then maybe um, do whatever they were meant to do, such as turn to God, and then ultimately their destiny is um, an eternal life in some other realm, and then the universe has basically served its purposes and, and goes and dies out. I prefer to think, as a theist, that God has more of a purpose for the universe than just that. The universe itself is ultimately destined to participate in the life of God. And how do I reconcile that with science? Well, I would claim that as far as we know, there may be a subtle order that we do not see in the universe that's going to be activated somehow, resulting in a transformation that we can hardly imagine of the universe. Think of the caterpillar. If we looked at a caterpillar right now, and we didn't know that it was going to turn into a butterfly, we would probably extrapolate out, it will just remain a caterpillar. We wouldn't see that hidden information that's in the caterpillar to become a butterfly. In fact, from the caterpillar's perspective, it couldn't even imagine being a butterfly. Same thing for the universe. So your belief is that the place that we will experience this afterlife is a transformation of the current 
heavens and earth. It might be the transformation of this world and some other stuff. Maybe we could move from this world to another universe that was created and underwent the same transformation. But the point is, is that we would spend our eternity in that transformed We would universe. be connected to that universe in eternity. And this would be a bodily resurrection or? Right, it would be a transformed body too. So I, I think the body itself is transformed or resurrected at the same time as the transformation of the universe. Transformed universe, transformed body. Robin is ambitious, give him that. Cosmology must make theists rethink their worldviews. It's fascinating what they conjure up. Their reasoning is engineered in reverse. They commence with their conclusion, which they assume to be God's revelation of the future. And then they try to fit the facts of science. What I need is a cosmologist willing to think afresh. Paul Davies is a perfect match. A serious scientist, he ventures further than most colleagues would dare. Paul directs the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts at Arizona State University. Paul, how do you project forward the intelligence we know we have today? How will this develop in this universe over these trillions of years? We have two contrasting images. One is where life arose on Earth and then intelligence just sort of came like a spark out of nowhere and was snuffed out within the twinkling of a cosmic eye. And maybe the entire history of the universe, you've just got this one planet and this one little sliver of time where beings arose that could put their finger on the pulse of the cosmos and discern the rules on which it runs. What an extraordinary thing that would be. The other extreme would be where somehow life and intelligence are widespread in the universe and they spread out more and more and more. We could uh, cross the entire galaxy in a tiny fraction of the age of the galaxy. So there seems to be no limit to the amount by which mind and life could reshape the universe. There's certainly enough time for that uh, to happen. Does this change the character of what the universe is itself? I believe that if life and mind are real cosmic forces, then it does change the way we look at the universe. Because if the universe is about uh, realizing its own mental potential or something, if it's going to end up uh, in effect a mental as well as a physical phenomenon, then that completely changes the character of things. I, I, we, we wouldn't view the universe again the same way if we knew it was going to end up becoming a supermind. Or... Now, some of our theological friends would listen uh, and smile uh, pleasantly and say that this vision of reality is a synthetic, impoverished version of the richness of a true theology. Right. I wouldn't uh, pretend to say I've worked out a complete theology here because I'm just uh, speculating. We're just looking at logical possibilities and I can't see any fundamental reason why life and mind can't uh, just spread and spread and spread. Maybe that won't happen, but I hope it will happen. So I'm a great fan of, uh, of a constructed dialogue between science and theology, but I think it's important not to have made up your theological mind in advance and then shoehorn the scientific facts to fit it. I just want to follow the science where it goes. I'm astounded how the human brain, which is lucky to last 100 years, can envision billions of years. Consider humanity's astounding progress in science during the past 300 years. Then take a deep breath and project forward, oh, say, three billion years. Life spreading out to populate and saturate the universe. Galaxies transformed into vast computers. Life evolving in a diffuse, expanding universe 
where there are no structures, only particles. But is any of this meaningful for us? Maybe because what may be in the future might reflect true reality today. Bleak or beatific, all facts point to bleak. And I'm not sure what beatific might be. But do we have all facts? Imagining what the far, far future may be and what it might mean takes us closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.